Greetings in the name of Christ and welcome to Concord Matters, a show that seeks unity in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ by his word through the study of the clear and concise teachings confessed in the book of Concord. As Peter boldly confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, we boldly confess the truth of the entirety of God's inerrant word, nothing more and nothing less. We do it all for the sake of a clear conscience in Christ for you. I'm your host, Brady Finnern, District President of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Thank you for joining us on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. We continue our study today, which I'm really excited about, as we talk about good works in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, or it says in Article 5, Love Fulfilling the Law. As we looked at this last week with Reverend Dr. Leonard Payton, he clearly articulated the word love and how good works are properly defined by works being done in faith in the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? We hear Jesus speak himself on this subject in Matthew 5 and other places, obviously throughout Scripture, that he says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. We simply are studying this not to try to prove a point, but to make sure that we're looking always at Christ when we're looking at good works. To look at all of this, we'll be studying good works seven times, which tells me a few things. First of all, this is an important subject for the Concordians and an important subject for us today, because people always are like, well, you Lutherans aren't doing good works. However, you know what? They focus on it then, and you know what? God is working through you today as well. So today, as we do this, open up your Bibles and open up your Book of Concord, and let's start confessing. If you have any questions concerning our study of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Joining us in the Confession of Christ, we welcome back the Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Minot, North Dakota. Pastor Richard, welcome back to Concord Matters. Hey, Brady, it's good to be here. Pastor, you know what? I'm going to do something a little bit different today, and I want to start with the Bible. Now, just to be clear, do you have your Bible with you, Pastor? I do. It's right here. (laughs) Very good. For you, for you, our listeners, I invite you to open up your Bible. Um, This brings me back. Pastor Richard and I actually had studied a number of times when I was on Thy Strong Word um, here on KFUO, and I invite you, our listeners, to also listen with Reverend Dr. Phil Boo on Thy Strong Word because they just study the scriptures, obviously incorporating the confessions and our belief. But it's bring me back a little bit to start with the Bible. Open up also your Book of Concord, which we will be studying from Concordia the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord from Concordia Publishing House, and we're on page 106. And the reason why we're starting with the Bible is that last week, Reverend Dr. Leonard Payton highlighted the story of the sinful woman who was forgiven in Luke chapter 7. And also, he Melanchthon does a beautiful job of giving us the theology in this and teaching through this a very important distinction of love and good works faith and good works. So I'm going to start with the Bible today. So we are in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and we, we are reading from the English Standard Version, Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that she, he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said to him, Say a teacher, a certain money lender who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will, let, will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. 
You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is foreign little, excuse me, who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with them began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I want to turn your attention to page uh, 106, number 31 as it speaks very clearly about this text. And I'm just going to read this because it's very important for our time today. And we keep this story in your mind. And, and Pastor Richard, I want to hear your first thoughts as we look at the connection of faith and good works. Number 31. Besides this way of speaking is well known, at times we used a word for something and we use the same word for the cause and effects of that thing, a synecdoche. For example, in Luke 7:47, Christ says, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. Christ himself interprets this when he adds, your faith has saved you, 750. Christ did not mean that the woman had merited forgiveness of sins by that work of love. That is why he adds, your faith has saved you. But faith is that which freely obtains God's mercy because of God's word. If anyone denies that this is faith, he does not understand at all what faith is. The story in this passage shows what Christ calls Quote unquote, love. The woman came with the opinion that the forgiveness of sins should be sought in Christ. This worship is the highest worship of Christ. She could think nothing greater about Christ. To seek forgiveness of sins from him was truly to acknowledge the Messiah. To think of Christ this way, this way to worship him this way, to embrace him this way, is truly to believe. Furthermore, Christ used the word love not toward the woman, but against the Pharisee. He contrasted the entire worship of the Pharisee with the entire worship offered by the woman. Pastor, I'm going to stop there for a moment because if you were to look, there's a lot of good stuff still yet to come, but I want to stop there just to kind of make this point. When we look at a sinful woman forgiven, the story, the true story in Luke chapter 7, it's very easy for us to look at that and say, oh, her works made her well. That's where our hearts naturally go. But what is the truth, and what is Melanchthon telling us so far? Yeah, very good question. You know, this morning I woke up, and uh, we've had some snow here in North Dakota, and uh, boy, I was so glad it was raining today. <laughs> we had, <laughs> I think we had about 12 inches of snow here a couple weeks ago, and we were moving snow, and it's really early to have that here, even in North Dakota. But nonetheless, um, like I said, it was was raining outside, and and and. You know, what if I were to say to you, you know, in, in, now there's there's a point to this, obviously. If I were to say to you, you know, how's it going North Dakota? I'm going to say, well, you know what? Uh, it's raining here because the windows are wet. Uh, in other words, uh, the windows being wet is the reason why it caused it to rain. You'd say, well, that's that's insane. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, the wet windows did not cause it to rain. Uh, mm. That would never understand that sentence that way. But if I were to say to you, it's raining because the windows are wet, we would automatically conclude that that's an evidential claim. In other words, the wet windows that I saw this morning as I looked out the uh, windows themselves uh, was evidence of it actually being raining outside, of it actually raining outside. And it's the same thing here. Uh, so when we read this, it's, 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 you know, if we were to put the emphasis on the uh, syllable of, you know, this woman loved in order to produce faith, or this woman loved her way into good faith in Jesus, Uh, it would be like me saying to to everyone else, uh, the windows were wet, therefore, because the windows were wet, that caused it to rain. It just does not make sense. And so when we read this, I would say the tendency for us to read it this way is because, well, we are work-centered as human beings. We tend to think, well, just kind of think that way. We always think about doing and acting and so forth. Uh, faith is something that typically does not come natural to us. It's something that has to be created from the outside in. And so automatically when we read this text, we read it from that uh, the actions of the woman rather than approaching it from the perspective of Jesus first. And it's so easy to say these, <laughs> it's so easy to say exactly what you said when it comes to faith. When it comes to being outside and looking outside, we know that's ridiculous. But we always sneak ourselves into the equation where we start saying, well, you know, I am this good work came from me and there happened to be a little Jesus in there or something along those lines. 
but there's other ways that this happens. Can you can you kind of give us some uh, practical realities of maybe it sounds Jesusy or it sounds biblical and a good connection of faith and works, but yet it isn't? Do you have any kind of practical examples of this of how we do this in our everyday life? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm going to steal from uh, you know other theologians that have come before me, and and it's you know, and actually I shared this on Sunday at St. Paul's Lutheran Church as we visited about this. I was a terrible grammar student in in high school, and I I probably still am to a certain extent. <laughs> um, but my understanding with the basic human language, or, or not human, see, there we go, the English language. There we go. Uh, <laughs> with the English language itself, we usually start off with what we call a subject, and the subject is the subject of the sentence. And then we proceed to uh, have a verb, and then after the verb, we would have a direct object. So, for instance, if I were to say Johnny hit the ball. Johnny's the subject, hit is the verb, and the ball is that which receives the action of the subject. And so the momentum is going to be from left to what left to right. Johnny hit the ball. And so what we typically do is when we read the Bible, we typically take um, ourselves and we put ourselves into that subject of the sentence. And so when we approach the scriptures, now obviously the scriptures should be read about Jesus to the woman, uh, and then you know, we look at that woman, it's, it's, if we're going to put ourselves in the shoes, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of that woman receiving the actions of Christ himself. But we often invert that. We put ourselves in the place of the woman or whoever's in the story. We, we, we don't put ourselves in the shoes of Jesus, typically. We're, we're smart enough to not to do that. But we put ourselves into the spot of the other characters, usually the ones that are pious and good and moral, and we look at their actions and what they're doing towards God, doing towards the Christ, and then we say, aha, there we go. They did these things. She she uh, put uh, perfume on his feet. She cried. She cleaned his feet. She did these things. So therefore, if I do these things unto Jesus, then je- therefore Jesus will be what uh, happy with me. And so we we typically uh, invert everything wrong. But I think we we should really pull it back and pause and say maybe we should see it from the perspective of what Jesus is doing to the woman. And if we start with Jesus and his actions to the woman, then we can see the reciprocal response of the woman back to Jesus himself. Uh, you know, for what, what one is given, much is, you know, that whole passage here, that parable where he, where he talks about much mm. forgiven, uh, you know, much and so forth. And that, I'm not quoting that quite exactly right, correct, but uh, namely we get the picture. We start with Jesus, then to us, and then we can see our response. And that's very clear from what we read so far from Melanchthon where he speaks about how uh, she had the faith that this guy was forgiving her. I mean, that she he was a forgiving guy, that this was a guy that would grant her this forgiveness. So she worshipped, if you will, that's kind of how they talked about it, that the Pharisees were always worshipping in order to be good with God. She was worshipping because he had already made her good. Yeah. And and that's the that's the real emphasis on the right syllable, I think is the right way I've, I've heard it before. I'm probably not good at English either, by the way. So you <laughs> you are blessed, both of you guys, both terrible high school English people. Anyways, um, but here it, it speaks so clearly about the emphasis always being on Jesus driving the verbs. And right. from there, the verbs that we do is still all glory be to God because he's the one who's working through us um, by his Holy Spirit. Sorry, you're going to say something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, something we have to also ponder on this is, you know, we, we pick up the story where where Jesus comes to the Pharisee's house to dine. And then approximately maybe around the same time that Jesus comes in, this woman, she comes in and, and she stands behind him at his feet. And then the story, and I, I mean, I, I, I think we cannot appreciate this enough. I mean, who does this uh, to a complete stranger? I mean, I, I, I've never had this happen where a complete stranger comes up and just does something. It, typically, there's some prior knowledge where you strike up a conversation or you show gratitude. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at this, she has a prior knowledge of Jesus being the Messiah, one who forgives, one who is mm-hmm. gracious, one who is loving. Otherwise, this story doesn't make sense. Why would, you know, she's just going along and all of a sudden she sees this Pharisee named Simon and this stranger that she has no idea who he is. And, oh, well, I'm just going to follow him in there and I'm going to, what, put some perfume on his feet and then start crying. I mean, you're not going to do that unless you have a prior knowledge to him being the Messiah who forgives sins, uh, to him who is gracious. And so we we have to have that context. Otherwise, if she's just going to a complete stranger, this whole text makes no sense and she wouldn't be doing that. 
And so the very fact that she's approaching Jesus in humility, not from the front, but from the back by his feet. And the next thing you know, she's completely oblivious, taking her hair out and using her hair as a wet mop uh, to, 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 to wipe the tears and the perfume off of his feet uh, while bawling her eyes out. Uh, there is a context, a huge context that she has heard the word of God. She has heard the forgiveness of sins from this Messiah. So she's coming to Jesus for the very, very right reason that he is the Messiah who forgives sinners, who forgives outcasts like her. And so, you know, keep in mind, she's been rejected by everyone as a sinner. This terminology is, is that she's an outcast. Uh, she, she's a nobody. And yet she hears the forgiveness in the Messiah. And boy, she is there with gratitude, with, with worship. Let's continue in the confessions. We're on page 106. Kind of, I stopped at a very inconvenient place. I apologize, but we're in between 33 and 34. And the first word is he rebuked. He rebuked the Pharisees, Pharisee, because he did not acknowledge that he was the Messiah, even though he performed the outward duties that a guest and a great and a holy man deserved. Christ points to the woman and praises her worship, ointment, tears, and so forth. These were all signs of faith and a confession. With Christ, she sought forgiveness of sins. It is indeed a great example, not without reason. This moved Christ to rebuke the Pharisee, who was wise and honorable man, but not a believer. He charges him with a lack of holiness and admonishes him by the example of the woman. In this way, Christ shows that it is disgraceful for the Pharisee. While an unlearned woman believes God, he, a doctor of the law, does not believe. He does not acknowledge the Messiah and does not seek from him forgiveness of sins and salvation. So Christ praises her entire worship. This often happens in the scriptures, that by one word we may embrace many things. Below we shall seek a greater length about similar passages, such as Luke 4, 11, 41. But, as, but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He requires not only alms, but also the righteousness of faith, he says here, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. This means that she had truly worshipped me with faith and faith's exercises and signs. He means the entire worship. Meanwhile, he teaches this. Forgiveness of sins is properly received by faith, even though love, confession, and other good fruit ought to follow. He does not mean that these fruit are the price or the atonement that reconciles us to God because of which the forgiveness of sins is given. So, Pastor, he, I mean, he, encamp he encompasses all of this with the woman, comparing the Pharisee and of her. How would you break that down? Let's say a quick Bible study, if you were to, as he speaks about this in Melanchthon. Yeah, I think I think the whole point of this uh, story that we read in Luke is is kind of contrasting the Pharisee and the a woman herself, uh, the degree of the woman understanding her sinfulness versus the Pharisee, who we would add is in the very same boat, uh, that we're all sin sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I've used this illustration before that, you know, when it comes to Christianity, if, if, if we think of the wild western of the good guy and the bad guy, um, we would all be the bad guy of the plot. There's only one good guy in the uh, good old western, and that's Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. There's only the one, the one guy who has the uh, slick outfit who is the good guy. And everyone else is 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 corrupted, and that includes this Pharisee. And so the problem in this story is the Pharisee, he sees himself distinguished from this lady. He sees her beneath himself. And so he does not approach or see a need for a Messiah because he's already self-righteous. Um, and whereas this woman, she she is actually more in touch with reality and understanding that she is a sinner and thought word indeed. And so because of that, she's going to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, whereas the man he sees no need of a savior, and thus he does not recognize Christ for who he is. And so the reason, and we, maybe we could say it this way: the the the, the motive for uh, the motive for being before Christ is also going to reveal our understanding of Christ's identity. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. And so she sees her need as a sinner. And she sees the need of forgiveness in Christ. So therefore, she properly understands Jesus as a Messiah, the forgiver of sins. Whereas the man himself, he does not understand himself as a sinner. He sees himself above sinners. So therefore, he has no need for a Savior. And he misunderstands the true nature of Christ himself. Uh, 
another illustration to think about is oftentimes if we think of those old teeter totters, you know, as a mm -hmm. kid, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, as 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 our view of mankind, the more we understand that we are sinners in thought, we're indeed, it's going to create a necessity in, for, in us to have a forgiver of sins. But if we think we're morally upright, established, and God is pretty lucky to have us, then we do not need a Savior for sinners, but then perhaps maybe we need a, well, a religious figure or uh, a, you know, a pom-pom Jesus from the sidelines who's going to cheer us on and say, go get him, tiger. Uh, drastically different needs of a Savior or a Messiah type figure, uh, dependent upon how we understand our sinful condition. And this reminds me of Luke chapter 17, the Pharisee and the tax collector, which, which many times I want to see myself as the tax collector. Like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm the one who's beating my breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When the old Adam and all of us, and I like how you said this, Pastor, is that we, we are on the same boat, if you will. We are on the same level as anybody else, you might think that person's awfully arrogant. That person doesn't think they need Christ. Well, you know what? Neither do I. And so, Lord, fill me with that faith. And the, you have the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the Pharisee goes and and he prays and and he basically says, you know, thank you. I'm not like anybody else. But the tax collector, and it says these words. And this this goes with how you approach the Lord and how we approach, I would say, holy things standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so this relates very clearly with that. And what would your, Pastor, as we look at these, this faith and works and, and worship and, and how we do so and how this all connects, especially the forgiveness of sins, what would be your encouragement, I would say, for a modern day, for, for our listeners, as we hear all this of the humility of the of the woman, we hear the humility of the tax collector. What would your encouragement be as we look at works and faith and love for our listeners? Well, I would say first we start with I think maybe there's a fear in in all of us, um, you know, admitting that we're guilty of sin and thought, word and deed. Because as soon as we admit that we're poor, miserable sinners, then you know who's going to want to play with us, right? I mean, who's going to want to be around us? You know, and, and, and the psalmist, uh, in the book of Psalms, it covers this, that, um, you know, when we talk about a broken and contrite spirit, um, a, a, a disposition that has been broken by sin, uh, a disposition where we're uh, hopelessly in a position of, of contrite repentance, uh, we, we hear that the Lord does not despise that. And that uh, the Lord uh, does not is not repulsed by that. It's not as if when we confess our sins, God says, oh, for goodness sakes, they did it again. You know, who's going to mm -hmm. clean up this spilled milk? You know, and, and then he's going to turn and huff and puff and go complain. Uh, no, our Lord God, when we confess our sins, he's quick. He is so quick to forgive. And he uh, pours on that, that, that forgiveness of sins right into our ears, pours it into our ears to hear that for Christ's sake, we are forgiven. And he does that through the mouth of the pastor. And that is one of the greatest joys of a pastor is to pronounce the forgiveness of sins upon uh, his sheep, to pronounce that to uh, individuals who are hopeless in, in their sin, to hear that their sins are completely and totally forgiven for Christ's sake. So now, once we hear that forgiveness, that uh, our sins are forgiven, then that actually frees us with joy and gratitude. Boy, gratitude is amazing. Uh, that gratitude to what then served my neighbor. And this is where we have to keep it very, very, very clear where um, I would push very, very hard uh, back against uh, some of those that would actually see that we're justified by or that faith comes about by our loving actions. No, no. Love itself, according to the, uh, Paul in the book of Galatians, love itself is a fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, and so forth. And so love is that which comes as a gift that is given. Uh, so as, as faith receives the gift of the forgiveness of sins, then love springs up out of that as an impulse, um, you know, to 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 love our neighbor. Uh, I'm reminded back in my days at uh, seminary, and uh, I had a professor. He'd always say to us, he calls called us gentlemen. He said to me, said to me, and a bunch of other guys, he said, gentlemen. He paused. He said, you cannot rightly love your church until you first have been loved by your your Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And his whole point was um, that uh, those who are loved much, well, then what? Uh, spill Jesus on other people while love in return. So we love because, obviously, because he has first loved us. And so um, am I saying, is it impossible to love without Christ? Absolutely. Uh, true love, uh, as, as described by 1 Corinthians 13, 
that that agape love uh, is a fruit of the spirit. It's a byproduct, a gift of uh, of a forgiven sinner, knowing that for Christ's sake they're forgiven, and then that love just springs forth. I want to talk further about this, but we need to take our break. We are confessing the biblical truth of good works from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. So stick around. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. Welcome back. We're confessing the biblical truth of good works in light of love, and obviously the cross and the greatest love that we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. Article 5 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession with the Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Minot, North Dakota. Now, Pastor, we are going to get actually to our assigned reading for today, which is on page 107 of the Reader's Edition of the Book of Concord from Concordia Publishing House. And it has a title here, No One Can Keep the Law Perfectly. I want to ask you this before we start reading, is why is it important that we remember that line, as you mentioned before, that we all are in the same boat, that we have a disposition that is completely broken? Um, Why is that so important as we look at good works uh, that we all understand that and we start on that same page. Well, okay, a couple things that can happen. Yeah, you know, if we can say that no one can keep the law perfectly, then one of the reactions is this: is well, then why try? You know, then 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 who cares? Mm-hmm. And, and and that's not that's not a logical conclusion to it. And then the other one is this: is that if we look at the law and we think that we're accomplishing it. Uh, then that goes the way of pride. And so we want to avoid the two pitfalls, the two errors of pride, which is, I'm doing this pretty well. I'm I'm, I'm pulling it off. I'm keeping the law pretty well. Uh, God and others should be pretty lucky to have me. Uh, that's that's an extreme amount of pride, which then depends upon, uh, as, 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 as they would say, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other other spectrum, the other ditch, you you could say, you know, falling on the other extreme would be, well, if I can't keep the law perfectly, who cares? Uh, then we go to a reckless, um, absolutely a recklessness uh, with well, what the fancy word they call is antinomianism it comes from this word namas, which means law, anti-law, that we're like, who cares about the law? I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I die. And both of those are, well, they're ungodly. They're absolutely 100% ungodly because they both do not trust in Christ as the centerpiece of our Mm -hmm. assurance and our forgiveness of sins. And so ultimately, when it comes down to it, the law is good. The law is true. The law is wonderful. And that law, as we see that good and perfect and holy law, as we look at that law in the eyes of of ourselves, we realize, man, I just don't do it. And so instead of us saying, well, I can do it or what, I don't care, uh, it drives us rather to a third option, which is repentance, which says, God, have mercy on me, the sinner, which is the cry of all of these people that we encounter in the uh, in the uh, Gospels, you know, blind Bartimaeus, all these people crying out for mercy, beating their chest and God, saying, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And then that brings us all the way back to what we talked about before the break, which is uh, this Lord God of ours, he does not despise us in our repentance, in our broken and contrite spirit, but he rushes uh, to pour that forgiveness of sins into our ears so that we might know we're his children. Well, let's start digging into uh, the article, Article 5, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. We are on page 107, number 38. Now let us reply to the objection stated above. The adversaries are right in thinking that love is the fulfilling of the law and that obedience to the law is certainly righteousness. But they make a mistake in this matter. They think that we are justified by the law. Since we are not justified by the law, we receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation through faith for Christ's sake. This is not because of love or the fulfilling of the law. It follows necessarily that we are justified through faith in Christ. In the second place, this fulfilling of the law or obedience toward the law is indeed righteousness, 
when it is complete, but it is small and impure in us. So our righteousness is not pleasing for its own sake and is not accepted for its own sake. From what has been said above, it is clear that justification means not the beginning of this renewal, but the reconciliation by which we are accepted afterward. It can be it can now be seen much more clearly that starting to fulfill the law does not justify, because such fulfillment is only accepted on account of faith. Nor must we trust that we are accounted righteous before God by our own perfection and fulfilling the law, but rather for Christ's sake. Pastor, there's I'm going to stop there, as it has two statements that I think are very important. That our, that our righteousness is not pleasing for its own sake and is not accepted for its own sake. And at the bottom of number 40, it ends with, but rather for Christ's sake. Makes a, you know makes the distinction there very clearly about us and Christ. And so what, what is Melanchthon telling us? I think we could summarize, summarize it best by just simply saying this. We could say, I don't do good works to become a Christian, but instead I do good works because I already am a Christian. And so the good works, as we think about other places where Jesus actually talks about a good tree bears good fruit, uh, a bad tree does not bear good fruit. It can't. And so the tree has to be uh, made good before it bears fruit. And so, but the whole idea of bearing fruit, that is something that happens naturally. Uh, it's just a byproduct of a, of a tree. Uh, and so we, we do good works uh, not to uh, validate ourselves as a, as a Christian or to create ourselves as Christians. We do it because we already are, uh, because we have the gift of the forgiveness of sins and a status before God Almighty as one who is forgiven. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's do I do good works to become a Christian or do I do good works because I already am? Well, it's because we already are. It's because what Jesus has done. And again, that comes back to that whole idea of Galatians, uh, this fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Uh, it's just great fruit that is bore. Um, as a result of who we are in Christ. I want to think about this for a moment. Is I was once at a, a Fellowship of Christian Athletes gathering. I, my wife and I coach track at the high school in our community in Sartell. And so you have occasional, when you have coaches clinics and everything, you have an FCA gathering. And we were there, and I remember specifically, these wonderful Christian people uh, were talking about how I try to live out the fruits of the Spirit every day. And it was, it was good, right? It was a good exhortation for us to live out the fruits of the Spirit. But there was never a moment where they said, this is the gift that God gives to us, that he helps us with this, or this flows down from the love of Jesus. And so, Pastor, how can, how can the fruits of the Spirit kind of get muddled as we look at everything when it comes to good works and faith and our relationship with the Lord? Well, a couple of things here. I, rem I remember a uh, youth once upon a time, uh, boy, you know, she's, she's a grown mother of three right now. And I, she had all these one little one-liners when she was in high school, when I worked with youth uh, ministry back in the day. And she said, you know, the problem, uh, pastor, is every time, uh, you know, we talk about good fruit, she goes, my old Adam wants to end up eating it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, Really, when it comes back down to this, I think I think the all these word pictures, these analogies are are just wonderful. Uh, think of the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, "I am the vine; you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear not you cannot bear you know bear fruit." And I would I was I would think it's important to point out that we as Christians we don't produce fruit; we bear fruit. Uh, this this is back to that whole analogy of being a branch that's connected to the vine. The vine is that which produces the fruit, and then as a branch, we're simply displaying it, bearing it. And that also ties into Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verses uh, uh, 8, 9, and especially 10 right there. It says where uh, God has created uh, good works in advance for us to walk in. And so they're already prepared for us to walk in, and we simply get to, to bear that as, as Christians. It's a great joy. And so then the question then comes, well, how do we, you know, how does that work? Well, it's, it's very simple. It's within our vocations. You know, so if you find yourself being a dad and, and uh, you know, uh, married, have a beautiful wife and a, and a child and that child messes up their diaper guess what that is a good work that god has prepared in advance for you to what walk in as you serve your little baby uh little baby boy a little baby girl and these good works are everywhere located in our vocations uh, to simply bless our neighbor and again you know those 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 good works that we we do um that is something where we're called into to simply be a servant to our neighbor 
Uh, but we don't grab that good work and hoist it up and say, aha, look at this good work. Now I'm officially an apple tree. You know, look at this fruit. Now, therefore, now I'm, no, an apple tree produces fruit and that's just the way it works. And we simply do those works of love graciously towards our neighbor. We don't have to draw attention to it because really we didn't produce it to begin with. Uh, we're just simply bearing it for our neighbor because that's what we do. That's who we are as Christians. Uh, we just simply walk in the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to walk in. Well, let's keep moving forward. We are on page 107, number 41, where Melanchthon kind of, he keeps teaching exactly what Pastor Richard is is throwing, uh, is, 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 is pointing us towards, and he keeps breaking it down in a way to remind us, where is the emphasis? For, uh, number 41. In the third place. Christ does not stop being our mediator after we have been renewed. They err who imagine that he has merited only a first grace, and afterward we please God and merit eternal life by our fulfilling of the law. Christ remains mediator, and we should always be confident that for his sake we have a reconciled God, even though we are unworthy. Paul clearly teaches this when he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not, therefore, acquitted, 1 Corinthians 4. Paul knows that through faith he is counted righteous for Christ's sake, according to the passage, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, Psalm 32. See also Romans 4. But this forgiveness is also received through faith, is always, excuse me, received through faith. Likewise, the credit for the righteousness of the gospel comes from the promise. Therefore, it is always received through faith. It must always be regarded as certain that we are counted righteous through faith for Christ's sake. If the regenerate afterward think that they will be accepted because of fulfilling the law, when would a conscience be certain that it pleased God? We never satisfy the law. We must always run back to the promise. Our infirmity must be recognized in this manner. We must regard it as certain that we are counted righteous for the sake of Christ who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. If anything thinks anyone thinks he is righteous and accepted because of his own fulfillment of the law, and not because of Christ's promise, he dishonors this high priest. He cannot be understood. How could someone imagine that a person's righteousness before God, when Christ is excluded as the atoning sacrifice and mediator? I love the language that he adds in here of the promise. What is, uh, he gets to the third place. And what is the third place that Melanchthon is focusing on? You know, uh, in, in thinking about this section here, I'm, I'm reminded of a conversation long, many, many, many years ago with, with a, um, uh, a gal in a church. It doesn't matter, the church or the, really the context, but uh, she was an accompanist and she came up and with just almost fear in her eyes, she, sa she said, you know, Pastor Rich, I really hope God was pleased with our worship today. Now. The way now there's a context, and I know what was behind the context. And I remember looking at her, I'll just call her Susie. And I said, You know, Susie, oh, Susie, God is already well pleased with you because of Jesus. Uh, rest, rest assured. And so, what had happened was she had, you know, we talk about the syllable or syllable, right? <laughs> she had put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. She was looking for assurance in um, her, her Christianity and her assurance before God Almighty on the basis of what she was doing that day during. The church service itself and so rather than looking at our assurance then in christ and so the, by 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 looking for assurance in how well she performed as an accompanist she was living with fear and that fear was then the driving motivator and factor for her whether or not she was having a correct standing before god almighty versus understanding that uh when it comes down to it that uh she has complete assurance already in jesus and therefore, when you have complete assurance in Christ, knowing that Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins in thought, word, and deed, therefore that creates gratitude, that creates assurance, that creates peace, knowing that I have a mediator, Jesus Christ, not just who, who you know, Melanchthon is hitting on this too as well, not just a Jesus who gives us a little tiny injection of his goodness and says, no, no, go on your own. It's almost like, you know, maybe a dad holding on the back seat of a bike and helping the kid get going, and then you kick the bike and say, pedal kid, pedal mm -hmm. kid, you're on your own. That's, that's not how Christianity works. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, you know, I connect you to the vine and then, you know, it's, it's on your own to, to, to water yourself and, 
you know, make something of your name and become a great branch. You know, you've got enough go-go juice within you to make it happen. No, it's about abiding in the present tense, daily abiding in the mediator, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And so back to that, that gal, Susie, it's for her coming into that church service, knowing I'm probably going to fail as an accompanist today in how I play this. I might miss my cues. In fact, I might even have my, my, my own sinful motives that are tied up in this, but to know that for Christ's sake, I'm forgiven of all of that and that Christ will uh, forgive me for even my impure motives of the day and that I can cling to Christ in the midst of all this and play with assurance and joy. Uh, maybe a small point on this, I always jokingly tell, not jokingly, well, kind of jokingly making fun of myself, but it is actually true. When I stand in the pulpit to preach at St. Paul's, um, I make the sign of the cross. I say, in the name of Jesus, amen. And simultaneously, every single Sunday, I have two intentions. Number one, as I hope my congregation, my sheep, my flock are blessed by the word of God. And then simultaneously, I hope I look good. <laughs> it's just, and it's every Sunday. And I even find myself, I'll preach it. I'm like, man, that came out well. And it's like, man, that, that sounded good, you know? Mm. And it's like, God have mercy on me, which is, is, is the law that I need the law to, to constantly reveal to me my sin. And so to understand, I need Jesus constantly. But then if, if, if I don't have Jesus, then it's going to be up to me to, like that gal Susan, Susie, to, to perfect myself to what, um, to, to maintain a certain level of holiness, which is never achievable. But when we are in Christ and his forgiveness, we are already holy. And so holy Christians in Jesus do holy things because, again, a good tree bears good fruit. I love the important distinction that you've you've made where it isn't like like you're baptized and Jesus says, okay, now you're good. You know, you just, just now you live your life or kind of give you, like you said, go, go juice or the father who holds onto the bike and then pushes them and the kids then take over. Um, that is such a tempting reality for us as, as I would say Americans for sure, but just as sinful human beings that we think, okay, God would give us this and then we do the rest, if you will. And yeah. here he speaks about Christ does not stop being our mediator, which is, is fascinating. One, it highlights, as we hear in Scripture, where it says that he is constantly interceding for us, which is from Romans chapter 8. But what other ways is Christ still working as our mediator? How would you describe that to us? Well, you know, it, it's it's there, there's a sense with this Christian faith, um, I would say it this way, in this Christian faith, uh, the older and the more mature that we become, we would often think, now I'm going to borrow from a guy named uh, Pastor, Professor John Kleinig, he talks a lot about this, mm -hmm. that maturity is often seen you know, in the realm where we go from, from uh, dependence to independence. Now, if I were to say to you, now I have three kids, if I were to say to you maybe you know, 15 years from now saying, my son still lives in my basement, has Star Wars pajamas and plays Xbox and, uh, you know, oh, you know, he's, he's 40 years old or whatever it would be. Uh, he'd say, well, well, boy, that kid has had a failure to launch. And we'd say, yeah. Um, but when it comes to Christianity, the reverse is true. Uh, as we mature, we realize more and more just all the different layers of depravity of sin and things that we fail, which makes us ever cling more, that more to Jesus. And in fact, as we get close to death itself, we realize just how weak we are and how much we desperately need Jesus. And so again, it's not away from Jesus. It's not as if we get a little bit of Jesus and we move away from him. It's, it's, it's a coming to an understanding how much more we need him every day because we understand uh, the trickery of our old Adam, the sinfulness that we have and the pain of this world, the suffering of this world, and then uh, that we cling ever more to Christ uh, each and every day as we abide in him. So again, it's constantly abiding him every day. And then as we abide in him, it's granting us a clean conscience that our sins are forgiven. Uh, abide in him is, is to give discernment of the word, to understand uh, the, the manipulation of the world, uh, to understand the trickery of, again, the tactics of the old Adam, and then to abide in that assurance unto the fact of uh, death that approaches us, unless he obviously comes back first. I want to continue on. Uh, there's so much more that we could unpack with these powerful words that you're saying. We're on number 45 on page 108. I want to read 45 through 50 because he makes just a wonderful argument of 
What need is there for a long of the of a long discussion? I love how he begins this part. And the need is so great, as Pastor just so beautifully told us. Number 45 on page 148. In the fourth place, what need is there of a long discussion? All scripture, all the church cries out that the law cannot be satisfied. Therefore, starting to fulfill the law does not please on its own account, but on account of faith in Christ. Otherwise, the law always accuses us. For who loves or fears God enough? Who has enough patience to bear the troubles brought by God? Who does not frequently doubt whether human affairs are ruled by God's counsel or by chance? Who does not frequently doubt whether he is heard by God? Who is not frequently in, enraged because of the wicked enjoy a better life than the righteous because the righteous are oppressed by the wicked? Who fulfills his own calling? Who loves his neighbor as himself? Who is not tempted by lust? Paul says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing, Romans 7. Likewise, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve my own, the law of sin. Here he openly declares that he serves the law of sin. David says in Psalm 143, verse 2, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Here even God's servant prays for the removal of judgment. Likewise, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Therefore, in our weakness, sin is always present, which could be charged against us. A little while after he says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you. Here he shows that even saints ought to seek forgiveness of sins. They are more than blind who do not realize that wicked desires in the flesh are sins, of which Paul says, For desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Galatians 5. The flesh distrusts God, trusts in present things, seeks human aid in trouble, even contrary to God's will. It flees from suffering, which is which it ought to bear because of God's commands. It doubts God's mercy on, and so on. The Holy Spirit in our hearts fight against such tendencies in order to suppress and kill them and to produce new spiritual motives. We will collect more testimonies below about this topic, although they are clearly everywhere, not only in Scripture, but also in the, by the, in the Holy Fathers. So, Pastor, after the end of this, I, I feel the strange feeling of, like he says, the law always accuses us. It, it's it's kind of it's comforting, as Melanchthon writes, you know, for who loves or fears God enough? He goes down this whole laundry list of saying, we're all struggling with this. But then it's almost kind of depressing because you would hope there'd be a time where I actually can get all these things at least a little bit better in my life. Pastor, how would you how would you speak to a soul like mine that's strangely comforted but not comforted in such words? Well, you know, if if we think of uh, you know, maybe you're familiar with like a stud finder, right? That you use on a wall and you it has a beeper and you run it over the wall and if you find a two by four behind the sheetrock, it goes beep, 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 beep. Now imagine I have one of those machines and 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 I can make it into a sin finder. And I, you know, we go and we wave it over <laughs> over top of the uh, woman from our text in, in in the Gospel of Luke. It would definitely go beep 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 beep. You know, sinner, they're they're through. And if I were to take that same uh, sin finder, if I were to wave that over the Pharisee in our text, it go beep beep beep. It still would register 100. percent If I were to wave it over me and uh, you as well, it would beep at 100. Uh, percent The fact of the matter remains that this is difficult many times for people to process is that we have this sinful nature to the very day that we die. Uh, that sinful nature is with us to the very end of the uh, day till we take our last breath until, or unless until Jesus comes back first. And so we have this sinful nature. It hangs around our neck. Uh, it's there. Now, um, twofold. Number one, that is discour- <laughs> it's mm-hmm. discouraging. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. Um, the other part of it, though, is there's a sense where there, there is a little bit of comfort to realize that everybody in my life uh, there are part of the same lot that we are all bearing this together um, as a whole, and so the very struggles that I have, Pastor Matt Richard has, the very struggles I have with my old Adam, my parishioners have that same struggle as well. We're all on the same level, battling the same fight. So there's a sense where compassion we can have. It's a little bit of compassion for each other, knowing that we're all dealing with the uh, same foul devil. We're dealing with the same crazy idealistic ide- ideologies of the world, and we're still all dealing with this old Adam. Now then. I guess then with that knowledge, then the question then goes, well, what do we do about it? 
And um, a lot of individuals, while well, maybe do more, try harder, which, okay, that can work to a certain extent. Um, there's a part of it too, where we do try to discipline the old Adam, curb the old, the old Adam, but then that just only curbs. It doesn't, doesn't do anything much more. Um, or we can hear the promise, which is mm. what we need. We can hear about Jesus, the promise which uh, is given to us that uh, even though the very good that I you know, want to do, I don't do, and the very evil I despise, and I end up even doing it, what hope is there for me? What hope is there for a wretched man named Matt Richard? What hope is there for a wretched man named Brady? Uh, and so forth. Uh, the hope is in Jesus. And I love it when, when the Apostle Paul gets to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, there is therefore what? He doesn't say there's oh therefore no sin in you. There's mm. no therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in Christ we are not condemned. In Christ we don't get what we should be deserving. We get the forgiveness, uh, the salvation, the hope of everlasting life, uh, a clean conscience, all because of Christ. When we don't deserve it at all. And what we do deserve is death and hell and condemnation itself. That's, that's the wage of sin. That's what we deserve. But for Christ's sake, we are given forgiveness, life, and salvation. And when we're giving, given that, my goodness, it's like, I, I, what, what do you do with that? That's just, I mean, that's the excitement of the gospel. That's the joy of the gospel. I've been given a sheer gift that I'm not worthy to receive, that I'm not worthy to have. And now, man, that tells me what, gosh, I'm going to love the Lord God. I'm going to serve my neighbor. And then what happens again, as we've talked about before, the old Adam creeps in and wreaks a havoc and throws a wrench in all of that goodness and throws it all into a tailspin. And then guess what? It's back to Jesus again. And this is why Luther said in the 95 Theses, as we kind of celebrate the uh, Reformation here, that the life of the Christian is daily repentance, daily what? Beating the breast, daily what? Returning back to Jesus for forgiveness, life, and salvation so that we may stay put, abide in the vine, stay with Jesus rather than wandering away from the gift of this gospel. I want to read a portion of this because often we could hear this and go, well, if this was true, then the Lutherans just kind of start making it up. And, and this is something affirmed definitely in the justification and the apology, but also reaffirmed here in love fulfilling the law, that this was not a new doctrine that they made up out of nowhere. It's by scripture. It's through, you know, it's been confessed in the past. So I want to dig through some of this as we close up our time. Uh, we're on page 108, number 51. The heading says, Church Fathers and St. Paul affirm justification through faith. Augustine well says, all God's commandments are fulfilled when whatever is not done is forgiven. Therefore, he requires faith even in good works. He says this in the, in, to show that we may believe we please God for Christ's sake, and even our works are not worthy and pleasing of themselves. Jerome against the Pelagians says, Then we are righteous when we confess that we are sinners, and that our righteousness stands not on our own merit, but in God's mercy. Therefore, when people start to fulfill the law, faith ought to be present, which certainly believes that we have a reconciled God for Christ's sake. For mercy cannot be received except through faith, as has been repeatedly said. Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Here's what we ought to understand. People regenerated through faith not only receive the Holy Spirit, but have motives that agree with God's law, but we ought also to realize they are, are far distant from the law's perfection. This point has a great importance by far, and we must add to it an argument also. We cannot conclude that we are counted righteous before God because of the fulfilling of the law. Justification must be sought elsewhere in order that the conscience may become peaceful. For we are not righteous before God as long as we flee from God's judgment and are angry with God. Therefore, we must conclude that we are counted righteous for Christ's sake, being reconciled through faith. This is not because of the law or our works, because of faith, beginning to fulfill the law pleases God. Because of faith, there is no charge that we fulfill the law imperfectly, even though the sight of our impurity terrifies us. If justification is so sought elsewhere, our love and works do not justify. Christ's death and satisfaction ought to be placed far above our purity, far above the law itself. This truth ought to be set before us so we can be sure of this. We have a gracious God because of Christ's satisfaction and not because of our fulfilling of the law. 
Pastor, with about two minutes left in our time, um, were the Lutherans making up a new doctrine when it came to faith and works? Yeah, obviously, no. The answer is no. I mean, it it it, it is it comes straight from the gospel, straight from the apostle Paul. We see this uh, everywhere. I, I'm 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 so much reminded as you were reading that. I'm so much reminded of the words in in the gospel, Luke, the seventeenth chapter. It says, "So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it, it's it's this idea that again, you know, I don't do good works to become a Christian. I do good works because I already am, and so therefore, uh, what I do is is not to add to my spiritual resume. It's it's done out of a gratitude, done out of a gift that has been given, and so we 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 do these good works and we love our neighbor because that that's that's what's been done to us. It's a gift that has been given. And then when we find ourselves not doing it, not loving our neighbor, uh, the law is going to show us what that love is. And keep in mind that the law is is love, and love is the law. And so when I don't murder my neighbor and uh, I support his life, I'm loving him. That's a wonderful gift. When I, uh, you know, do not slander my neighbor, but speak kind words, I'm upholding the eighth commandment. Love has a shape and a form, and that shape and form is the ten commandments. And so when I find myself not doing that, well, obviously it's to repent and get back where I belong, which is in the forgiveness of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, uh, centered in abiding in him, so that what may happen as a result of that is that I may abide in him and the Holy Spirit may what produce good fruit that I can walk in yet again until, again, I mess up and it's back to where I begin. So we're always beginning again, always going back to Jesus daily uh, to hear that forgiveness of sins, just like that woman coming before Jesus uh, with worship, uh, to receive, to hear, to abide with Christ. For these words, I think all I can say is amen. But that's our time. The Reverend Dr. Matthew Richard of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Minot, North Dakota, clearly confessing the biblical truth of good works and also as we look at love, the love that we have from Christ from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Pastor Richard, thank you for being our guest. Absolutely. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finnern. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand.